Hi, my name is Michelle Hughes and I serve as Federal Policy Associate for the National Young Farmers Coalition in Washington, D.C. The following workshop was hosted at this year's National Leadership Convergence in Boulder, Colorado by the Ad Hoc Committee for the New Young Farmers Federal Policy Setting Process. After viewing the video, please visit our website at www.youngfarmers.org slash policy setting to vote or check your email if you're already a member. Enjoy. So we're in the voting process where we are deciding, do you even like what we're proposing here? <laughs> um, if that is approved and the voting is finished on December 15th, if that is approved and we say yes, we're going to move forward with this process for the uh, policy setting process, um, then we will start in 2020 um, with these mechanisms that I've just described. And then 2021 will be when we release our first platform with our policies. And that will be timed with when a new Congress comes into office. So we release a new platform, a new Congress comes into office in 2021, and we start advocating. because um, working to ensure that the voices of our um, minority groups is important to me. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, we talked about how difficult um, this process is going to be and how long it's likely to be and what are some, again, attainable, realistic um, steps and goals that we can set. And so we agreed to have um, the seats on the affinity or on the policy council for uh, BIPOC, which would be black, indigenous people, or people of color, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, the LGBTQ, um, and a women's uh, representative, a veterans representative, and then at large members. And um, <clears throat> so this is just a start, and it's not going to ensure that you know all the voices are heard equally. And there's a lot of other um, affinity groups that we discussed um, being a part of this. And um, as the process goes on, you know, maybe considered, um, but. Uh, you know, this is a start to start getting those voices um, as a part of the process and ensure that there's a seat. And so there will be uh, opportunities to nominate yourself for one of these positions, um, but you can't be like a um, the BIPOC representative and the regional representative. You have to choose like one or the other. Does that make sense? <coughs> Two slides because um, I was the last one to sign up for slides. So, <laughs> so what happens when you're a procrastinator? Um, how, how are we feeling about this so far? We feel a little comfortable? A little com I see some head nods, I see some drool. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to try to explain this very simply. And if it gets confusing, I want to check in with y'all and make sure that um, there's no confusion. Sound good? Okay, cool. Uh, so really quickly, kind of looking at the makeup of, I guess I'll kind of go over here. Okay, cool. I don't know why I just walk like that. Um, okay. <laughs> I feel like a keyboard out. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, so with the makeup of this uh, group, we're doing it uh, both by regions as well as by affinity group uh, representation. Uh, so for, let's say, for the Northeast, they have two members, uh, two representatives. Uh, one will be a general regional representative and one will be a BIPOC representative for that region. Uh, as well as with the Northwest, Southeast, Southwest, and Midwest. Uh, we also have affinity group representatives. Um, and for each one, so with LGBTQ+, we have one member that will be on this, uh, this committee we, for veterans, we have one member that will represent the veteran community. Uh, for women, same thing. At large, we actually have two members uh, that will be chosen and selected and will represent for this council. And then we have the board liaison. Uh, now, board liaison is not a voting member. However, they are there to represent the board. Uh, so we want to make that very clear because, uh, I, like, 
I like everybody, I trust the board and stuff like that, but if some of y'all may have felt like, uh, I don't know where they're taking this, I don't know where they want to take this, uh, we just want to make sure that there's a lot of transparency and clarity in that, and that this is very, very member ran. Does that make sense? Okay, y'all comfortable with that? Okay, cool, perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, did I miss anything? No, I didn't. Okay, cool. Next slide. All right. I just want to read this. <laughs> Conditions. Not holding multiple seats. What does that mean? All right, uh, kind of like something I said earlier, uh, if you are running for, let's say, uh, regional seats, that doesn't mean that you can also run for the regional bipod seat, right? That you would see how that could get confusing, I'm assuming, right? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, however, if you are a part of an affinity group, which is not to be confused with um, uh, the affinity representatives, so let's say you're African American, let's say you're a woman, veteran, part of the spectrum, whichever you are, you can still apply to be a uh, regional representative, if that makes sense. So there could technically be two uh, minorities that represent a region. That, that could be cool, perfect. All right, um, all committee members must be dues-paying members. All right, that's kind of important, right, to pay your dues. I actually forgot to pay my dues, and then the law had to provide me <laughs> twice. And I was like, okay, we're on it. Super easy, super simple, um, 35 bucks, easy to go. Um, and so we want to make sure that each member on this committee is dues-paying because that's kind of putting skin in the game, and that's making sure that you do represent this coalition. Um, next up, army experience is not required, but stated in nominations. Uh, so for me, I'm an at-large member, although I do not currently farm. I do have farming background, and also do a lot of advocacy work within farming communities, both locally, statewide, regionally, and internationally. Uh, and so being able to kind of, uh, as an at-large member, if you do not currently farm, uh, but let's say you're part of a, um, a chapter, you can still apply to be in one of these positions. You would just have to state what your background is. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Cool, perfect. All right, selection process. Self nominations for each seat on committees. No one's gonna nominate you, right? You have to nominate yourself first. All right, uh, and so basically, like, <laughs> so basically you have to nominate yourself. Uh, you have to put yourself out there, and the process for that is going to be a four-week process for nominations, uh, as well as a two-week, uh, two weeks for voting. Right, so you want to have four weeks to kind of put yourself out there. You know, I don't know if we're doing campaigning. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, and then there's going to be a uh, two-week voting process for all you members uh, who will be voting for your representatives. Uh, and kind of going on to uh, with that part. You can only vote for, let's say it's a regional seat, you can only vote for someone within your region. So if you're in the Northeast, you can't vote for someone in the Southeast for a, uh, for a Southeast regional position. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Affinity uh, groups and regions vote for their reps. Okay, oh, wow, I just, I just did that. Okay, perfect. Uh, operations, uh, two year terms, uh, max is three years. For this first, uh, let me, Make sure. Nope. Sorry, it's a nice and three terms. That's a typo. Oh, okay. We got that clarified? Okay, cool. Uh, I'm going to read this so just so I don't screw this up. Okay, cool. Uh, so basically, what that means is for this first kind of starting out, uh, half of the first policy committee will serve one year instead of two to stagger over term. Uh, turn over. Uh, and so basically that's just making sure that after those years are done that everyone doesn't leave. Uh, we want to have some continuity, some consistency. Uh, and so it's really important that for this process to kind of flow, for this committee to also be viable and effective, that we have members that know what they're doing as well as while we're onboarding new members. Make sense? Cool. I love the head nods. It's, it's good. It's a good sign. Uh, quarterly meetings being a conference hall plus convergence. Uh, so quarterly meetings, quarterly means four times. Um, there are some grace to that. So if you are nominated, selected, 
uh, and you are a member of this committee, what that means is that you have an obligation to at least three of those four meetings, right? So let's say, you know, hurricane, tornado, natural disaster, pet die, wherever it might be, right? You have the option to miss a meeting. Now, don't intentionally miss a meeting, but like, you have the option to miss a meeting. Uh, and with convergence, that's only if you have uh, said that I am committed to going to convergence. Uh, there are members of this ad hoc committee that did not commit to that. Uh, so if that was an example, they would not be subject to, you know, not being a part of that. Uh, can't miss more than one meeting per year. Um, again, uh, if you do miss more than one, what basically happens, and this is not to be like too serious, but it is important, um, you are subject to removal. Uh, no hard feelings, we still love you, fam, it's all good. Um, and, and things happen, right? And so having transparency and saying, this was a lot more committed than I thought it was, that's completely okay. You can actually opt out yourself. We would rather you do that than have you be removed by the committee. Um, but that's also up to the committee on whether or not we want to actually remove you. It's not a hard line, you miss two meetings, you're out. You know, but we would vote on that as a committee. Uh, and then important stuff, I just want to read this. Actually, I'm not going to read this. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase this. That's, yeah, we'll do that. Um, we've spent a lot of time really trying to uh, create this uh, policy setting. And the reason why uh, we spent a lot of time is because we value it. We really think it's important for how this organization is going to move forward uh, in terms of uh, being equitable, having proper representation. Uh, again, the way that we structure this, we really structure it in a way uh, that provides that uh, set up for equity. Um, but I also want to enlighten everyone, in case you didn't know, um, this was not easy. Coming up with all this was not easy. I mean, weekends were spent on Sunday night. There were NFL games going on. You know, I can't say I wasn't watching while I was doing it. Um, you know, there were conferences. Um, but like all in all, we put a lot of hours into this because we really believe in this process and we really believe that we thought this could make uh, NYFC more effective. Uh, and so I hope that y'all will consider this not just as a uh, potential committee member, but also just as a uh, general member that you would participate in the voting process. And I also want to put a plug, like definitely apply to be a committee member. Like it's not terribly hard. Um, and put yourself out there. Nothing wrong with that. And I'll shut up now. All right. So I'm going to walk us through the actual policy setting timeline. Bear with me. It's four slides. Uh, so to start, um, we based it on the congressional calendar. Uh, the timeline will fall over a two-year period, with the first year of implementation being the first year of the uh, platform implementation being 2021, uh, and that's to align with the new Congress in DC. Uh, in even years of the process, beginning 2020 will be the implementation of the uh, the administration of the policy survey and policy meetings held by regional members and affinity groups. Um, the results of both the surveys and also the meetings will be analyzed by staff and the policy setting committee, and then drafted into the policy platform. Uh, the initial platform will be presented at Convergence and then will be voted on by all dues paying members. Uh, electronically, each component will need at least a 51% vote to uh, be included in the final version. Following the first cycle of the platform development, future processes will develop amendments to the standing platform, so we're not going to reinvent the wheel every time. We'll just build upon what we already have. Um, and so that will happen, um, where did I go? Uh, yeah, and it will be presented at Convergence and then voted on electronically. So the next slide. So let's walk through the timeline of uh, the first year. So this is 2020. So we were really trying to be uh, um, aware of the, the timeline as far as the fact that we're all farmers and take that into consideration as we put this together, uh, in addition to being in line with, with uh, Congress. 
So from January to April 30th, that's the first block of it. Um, staff will distribute dues paying members to the policy survey. And then by April 30th, regional members and affinity group, groups will hold local policy meetings to collect feedback and, uh, from members and inform policy decisions and report back to staff, results back to staff. And then after that, we get into the next block, which is May 1st to October 30th. During that time period, staff and policy committee members will analyze policy meeting, uh, I'm sorry, will analyze policy survey and policy meeting results and draft the federal uh, platform. By October, prospective policy committee members submit um, self-nominations for a vote. So October uh, 31st, keep that in mind if, if this is something that you're interested in. And then in November, staff publishes results of survey and policy meetings via email, website, and social media to coalition to the coalition with uh, with a draft platform. And then a staff and policy committee uh, will present the platform at convergence. Then when we get into November, so we've got November to December fifteenth, because we all know that after December fifteenth, everything goes to the wayside. Um, <laughs> Dues paying members vote on each component of the federal policy uh, platform and their policy committee representatives. Each component will need a 51% vote to be included in the final version. So if we and, and so if we go into the next slide, so the reason why the policy survey will only be um, given out once every other year is to reduce the burden on staff. It takes a lot of man hours to process all of that. First put out the survey, process all of the information, and then actually do something with it. So that's the reason why that's staggered. Um, so in the odd years, uh, regional members and affinity groups will hold policy meetings, but there will be no survey or amendments on the platform, as I just said. These odd years will be spent drafting the survey to be administered the following year. So that gives us a good amount of time to work on it uh, so that we're really intentional and nothing's rushed. Um, and then uh, both years will include advocacy in DC uh, on each component laid out by the policy platform. And then so now let's get into what year two looks like. So during year two, the first time this is going to be implemented will be 2021. So January to March 31st, staff will release platform and begin implementation in DC. And then by April 30th, regional members and affinity groups will hold local policy meetings, uh, excuse me, local policy meetings to collect platform feedback and membership, uh, feedback from members and inform policy decisions and report to staff. And then uh, back to September to December, Staff and policy committee design and staff and policy committee will design the survey to be administered the following year. Then by October, prospective policy committee members will submit self nominations for vote. So the, once again, keep October in mind if this is something that if you decide to skip out in 2020, 2021 by October, uh, go ahead and get that done. And then by November, federal federal policy setting process evaluation listening sessions where participants can provide feedback on the process for designing the platform. So, you know, we want to make it really open and understand everybody to understand that this is a working model. It's a living, breathing document. What we create the first time out isn't going to be what we're stuck with, and it's really important that we get your feedback so that we can do proper iteration going forward. And then uh, by November to December 15th, November 15th to December 15th, Member, members and affinity groups vote on the new representatives and uh, to the policy committee. So even if you, you know, opt not to be a part of the committee, just keep that in mind that it's time to vote for those that are going to be on the committee uh, November to December. So I will pass it on. So as we kind of have talked about throughout this whole presentation, um, there are three really main roles within forming a platform. So there's the policy committee, which we discuss who's going to be on that committee, there's the board, and there's the young farmer staff. So the board itself is just going to be a liaison, there's going to be a liaison member that actually sits on all the meetings with the policy committee, and they're going to be ensuring that whatever platform we come up with aligns with the overall objectives of the National Young Farmers Coalition. They're also going to be there for any legal work that we're 
um, having trouble with and just going to be there as an advisory partner. Um, the main part of the work is going to be for the members, for us. So the policy committee itself is going to be developing the platform. They're going to be doing this based off of listening sessions that they're going to be working with staff to go to. They're going to be doing this based off of the survey. Um, the survey is something that the committee itself is not going to be doing most of the legwork for. They're going to be providing guidance to the staff, and the staff and the committee are going to be working together on how to come out with that actual survey. The staff is going to be then analyzing the results of the survey, analyzing the results of the different chapter meetings that are going on, and are going to be reporting those results to the policy committee itself, who's going to use those results to uh, create a platform. Uh, there's one other part that the policy committee and the staff will be working on together, and that are emerging issues. So we all know that things come up, and if there's an emerging issue, something that hasn't already been mentioned within the platform itself, we, are, we have created a way for the policy committee, staff, and the board to implement those emerging issues that aren't necessarily being voted on. So kind of like a quick track or fast track way to make sure we're addressing any issues that are coming up. And then one main role, too, that the Young Farmer staff is going to participate in is actually how do we use this platform to better the world, really, right? How do we then get on the ground and do the lab work? So they're going to be creating um, policy strategy around that and working with members throughout different chapters and uh, at-large members for going to D.C. or doing planning and advocacy at the state level as well. So as we talk, so now we have the platform, so what is the platform actually made out of? So the platform itself is going to be really a living document. So if you think about our U.S. Constitution, it's a living document that can be continually amended. We're not going to be reinventing the wheel every two years. We're going to be going off of a base document and adjusting that based on what we see from the survey results and our other listening sessions. Um, so we had talked about two, two that the regular biannual review, so we can ha we can have different adjustments to the document through emerging issues. We're really going to be focusing on this at the two-year level. And we really, as we have discussed already, we're focusing on that two-year because that's based on U.S. Congress, and that way we can, as new Congress comes in, we can really be prepared to adjust our platform and attack the new Congress in ways that we want to. Um, we have set up the platform so that we have kind of a broad spectrum of policy pillars, is what we're calling it. We want to keep that to a minimum of five, and those policy pillars will be like land access, student loan forgiveness, something that is on a broader scale. And then based off of those policy pillars, we will create separate um, policies or separate activities or actions that we will go towards those policy pillars. So we're trying to have it so that there's kind of lanes for us to go in. So that way, if we're looking at land access, you know, there may be many different policies that we're looking at within land access that we need to attack. Um, and then I kind of already talked about the emerging issues part of it as well. Um, one thing I do want to point out too um, is that this whole process is going to be um, continually changing, and at the first, it's going to be a lot of legwork to start. You know, that as we're creating a living document, we need to start doing everything from the beginning. Um, but as that beginning legwork uh, takes into action, it'll be much easier from there, and we'll be able to really digest more of the results and see how we can adjust our platform. And that's it. <laughs>